Hello, I'm Tom Blushier. I'm reading from Journey Through a Tragic Comic Century, written by Francis Nenick and translated by Katie Derbyshire. It is the story of a century, a story about the insanity of ideologies, a story about a man who was always there right where history happened. His name was Hasso Grabner and he was a German communist. And this is how it begins. 21st of October 1911 is not exactly an outlier when it comes to dates in world history. In Vienna, an archduke marries a princess and the local emperor makes an amusing toast. In Utica, New York, a gigantic Mississippi farmer and a puny traveling circus employee empty the contents of their revolvers into the body of a lion, clutching its 12-year-old girl, Tamer, in its jaws. And in Leipzig, a boy is born by the name of Hassel who would later claim not to know the slightest thing about his father. A mother, of course, is present in the case of young Hasso, as is right and proper. And the father is to emerge later on, albeit from a heap of files. And why not? The men in the family have an obsession with paper, after all. The boy's great-uncle even wrote the second volume of Marx's Capital. That is, he didn't write it exactly, more transcribed it, which is no mean feat either, when you consider that Marx, on his death, left not a finished book, but a manuscript so hieroglyphic that his companion Friedrich Engels needed not just a whole year, but also a personal secretary to get the papers Marx bequeathed him, barely grouped, let alone processed, even approaching print ready. That very secretary, it turns out, was the great uncle of the little boy who has just been born here on this page. And while the one is called Hasso Grabner, the other is called Oskar Eisengarten. Incidentally, that name, Garden of Iron, is one of those benevolent contradictions that only the 19th century could produce. In any case, when the publisher Otto Meissner ran the presses at Leipzig's Reusche printing plant in July of 1885, it was Eisengarten's transcription of Kapital that served as the source. A quarter of a century later, little more is left of the great uncle than a small gravestone weathered by English rain, and all that young Hasso has left is a mother who earns a meagre living as a salesgirl and a christening certificate that reveals to him that his father was not only unknown but also unmarried to his mother, for which reason the pastor felt obliged to prefix extra to the pre-printed word marital on the certificate. In short, the family has seen better days and money is tight, even with his grandmother and aunt supporting his mother, so at the age of 12, Hasso Grabner is sent away to the nearby town of Halle and then on to various foster families in Gera, where he perhaps finds a roof for his head, if not a home. What the boy does not manage, however, is to complete school. By the time he returns to Leipzig in 1926, just turned 15, his mother is on her deathbed. Politically, though, Hasso Grabner is almost an old hand by this point. Not only is his family, at least as far as their memory serves, part of the original lineage of Saxon social democracy, oh no, Hasso Grabner himself has also done something for the revolution, stealing ammunition at the age of 12 and spying on the despised Jungstahlhelm junior paramilitaries, so it comes as no surprise that, 
In a narrative resume composed for the Socialist Unity Party's regional directorate, 45 years later in the GDR, he declares outright that he took part in the armed struggles of 1918 to 1923, as far as my childish capabilities allowed. Memory, as every child knows, is the basis of history. Ideology, however, as will become clear later on, is the form in which history is expressed.